Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. This week, I saw an interesting article that was shared on InfoSec Twitter, and It was about India currently blocking Signal, or they're trying to attempt to block Signal, which is the messaging app. And India has a pretty strict social media policy already. They try to monitor social media. And I don't think there's a lot of people who would disagree that you might need to monitor social media from a certain aspect, or at least moderate it. But what they're trying to do is kind of bridge this gap between social media and messaging, which messaging is kind of this protected like personal area versus social media, which is a lot more open. And so their thought process of how they're trying to bridge this gap or almost circumvent their own social media policy is saying that Signal allows messages with links to be forwarded to groups And because you're able to do that, it's essentially social media, kind of like sharing things on social media with a bunch of people. And another thing that was interesting in the article was that they excluded iMessage. There was a lot of speculation on why iMessage was excluded. Some thought that because a lot more users use iMessage, versus Signal, some people thought that maybe because India wanted Apple not to get mad at them because they wanted business from manufacturing to move into India. Or maybe because forwarding is not as prevalent within iMessage. But there wasn't exactly a specific reason. But I just thought it was interesting that Within the article, they literally said iMessage was not included. It was just trying to block Signal. A couple of things here. First off, Apple has already faced some challenges with the Indian government as far as being able to sell iPhones in India. I believe there was at some point a requirement that Apple had to manufacture devices in India to sell them there, or at least some portion of their iPhone business had to be manufactured there. So there is already something going on there where Apple is making a certain amount of Indian iPhones in India. And, you know, the iPhone has actually struggled to gain market share in India because of the um, different economic conditions there compared to other countries. And here's a little bit of a throwback and I'm going to bring up something that we'll see test your kind of technology history. This kind of came up with Blackberry. So if you remember, BlackBerry uh, used to be this brand of handheld uh, smartphone, kind of smartphone, and it had a really popular end-to-end encryption, encrypted messaging platform, BBM, um, or BlackBerry Messenger. And there was some, and I don't even remember the details of this, but there was some drama over the fact that it was end-to-end encrypted and the Indian government couldn't read the contents of the messages. So this is not without precedent. I mean, this happened you know, 10, 12 years ago with BlackBerry in India. And I don't remember what the resolution was. I, I believe uh, BlackBerry stood their ground on this and, you know, but I don't remember. Um, but that's something we should look up or maybe throw in the show notes some details on that as kind of a, a past indicator of it. And then the other thing about iMessage too, when we talked about all of our different chat app options and talked about the end-to-end encrypted status of them. While it is true that iMessage is end-to-end encrypted, it is also true that there tend to be ways there where um, subject to a valid legal subpoena or equivalent in India, um, Apple may produce backups or logs or something equivalent that is going to have your iMessage backups there and then they can view the contents of them. So it's actually like to have your iMessages end to end encrypted if nobody ever read them. You have to turn off like iMessage in the cloud. You have to turn off iCloud backups and back everything up in your local iTunes and on and on and on. So maybe there's something there too where there's the potential economic business angle. 
uh, or potentially it's the fact that the Indian government knows they can get iMessages through other means if they really need to. And so that could be a possibility as well. Yeah, that makes sense. I didn't think about it like that. And Signal is always kind of contentious with a lot of organizations or just the reputation itself of Signal because it's end-to-end. A lot of people think that if you're using it, you can be hiding something. This actually came up uh, quite recently because Signal has this weird function where if you have them as a contact in your phone and they join Signal, so for example, if I have Adam's phone number in my phone and I have Signal installed and then Adam joins Signal for the first time, it actually shows me a little welcome message that says, hey, Adam Brewer's on Signal. And that's not something that Adam can turn off. I could turn it off on my end, which is really weird. Like I can turn off, I don't want to see when my contacts join, but Adam can't turn off on his end, don't let anyone see when I join. And where that came into kind of contention was in situations of domestic abuse where one partner the person who was abusing would have signal installed for whatever reason. And then the victim would then install signal and maybe use it to communicate without their abuser knowing would join signal. And of course, like because the abuser has probably had the phone number in their phone, it would show up as, you know, so-and-so has joined signal. And then they would be like, well, why did you join signal? What are you trying to communicate? Who are you trying to you know, communicate with? And why are you trying to hide that communication with me? And not saying that that is always the case, but I think just in general signal has, because it's end to end encrypted, it has this reputation of you're trying to hide something from someone. And a lot of times when you, even when you mention, Oh, I use signal for communication. You talk to, people outside of information security, they're like, oh, I don't really care. I don't have anything to hide. You know, that comes up quite a bit. Like you talk about privacy and they're like, I don't really care. I don't have anything to hide. So I think that that in itself leads to a lot of people trying to block signal because they think they're trying to communicate in a malicious way when maybe they're not. Mm -hmm. And signal is oftentimes just blocked using some default security tools. For example, at my previous organization, we used a tool called Zscaler. And we didn't turn on any special filters, but just by default within Zscaler, it was blocked. It considered it kind of like a Tor or like a BitTorrent, and it just blocked this, the actual dns request to signal server if you had it installed like on your computer with the desktop app it wouldn't work so you had to actually go in there and look at the dns request from the signal app that was on your desktop and put them into the allow list before it would actually sync all your messages and again that's the default setting for zscaler we didn't put in any specific things like block secure messaging that was just part of it so um and then as well as now at Microsoft, we have seen some of our coworkers when they try to update Signal, not all of them, if you're installing it via PowerShell or you know you have admin on your machine and you install it uh, via command line, it will still install. But if you're updating it, you know via the the GUI, uh, it can get flagged as a as an app that you're not supposed to have, which is interesting um, because I don't think it's malicious, so to speak. But again, for some reason people think that signal is something that you shouldn't have on your machine. And it's important to point out that Microsoft has a very hands-off endpoint management strategy where uh, it is extremely um, lenient and liberal compared to a lot of organizations where for the most part you can um, have the leeway to use the tools. You need to do your job as long as they're not on any sort of disallowed or naughty list. Um, and, and they will get flagged when they are. And so signal potentially joining that list is of note because given Microsoft's pretty liberal device management policy, that's, that's notable that it is raised enough ire to potentially make the list. Cause like Tor browser, for example, is blocked on Microsoft managed devices. Mm-hmm. And I remember sitting in a session with, Brett Arsenal, who's the CISO for Microsoft, and 
He's like, I know every single person who's tried to run Mimi Cats on their machine, so don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and you know, I think for in general communication apps like Signal, WhatsApp, a lot of the fat clients that are out there now that are people are familiar with, like Discord and Slack, that may not have enterprise licensing. Discord for sure doesn't have enterprise licensing, but maybe you are a Slack enterprise customer or you have users who are in Slack channels that are part of different dev communities or other communities that they have uh, information. You know, those are methods of data exfiltration. So I think that that is a concern for security and information protection organizations that want to make sure that their IP, their intellectual property is not being exfiltrated and dropped into unmanaged applications. So I I think that that is a concern, and that's maybe why you would want to even think about blocking messaging apps like this. Yeah, I agree. And one thing I'll say on this from a strategy perspective is – this is where you kind of have to decide what is like our, our strategy around preventing data exfiltration. Are we trying to close every single door, every single loophole? Are we trying to play the cat and mouse game and keep up and block every single new data exfil Avenue as we become aware of them? Or are we trying to prevent like casual data exfiltration or um, even moderate efforts to do data exfil, but we're not trying to, you know, patch every single hole you kind of have to think about that and maybe look at different methodologies, which we'll talk more closer to the end of the show, as opposed to trying to close every exit, maybe securing the data more downstream might be an option as well. But certainly I think for a lot of these messaging apps, because they're gaining in popularity and they are familiar and they have a lot of casual use cases by blocking them where they don't, necessarily bring a lot of business value and they do represent an avenue for easy and casual data exfiltration, it's a quick win, right? Like, I mean, ultimately as I, as I think about it and I don't love that because I, I, I use these apps sometimes on either personal devices. I have enrolled in corporate information or on my corporate device. Um, and I, I find them handy. And so I appreciate the more liberal approach, but it depends on your organization's risk appetite and, uh, how you want to approach it. But I, I certainly do caution orgs like going down the pathway of trying to block every single avenue and every hole, I think is a losing effort. But I certainly do appreciate trying to prevent, you know, casual um, examples of it. And I think that's okay. As we, we've we talked through kind of our strategy a lot of time again is you don't need to be like Fort Knox, but you just need to be a less attractive target than the you know, organization next door. If you, if you do all the simple things, all the right things, um, you make it a lot harder for bad things to happen. And, and this is, I mean, it's a relatively quick win, like blocking a couple apps is not terribly hard depending on almost any tool set you have. So this triggered a question in my mind as I read through this article, because I think a lot of times when you're a security shop and you start implementing tools, people will want to know, hey, this is blocked. Why are you blocking it? And how do you decide initially what to block and what not to block? Because oftentimes there's not a written policy. If you even have a security policy around this, it should be written generally, right? Like it shouldn't be written to say we're blocking this specific tool or this specific site. It should be we block cloud storage applications with the exception of ones that we have an enterprise agreement with. And, you know, that can change. Maybe one day you are using OneDrive, maybe another day you are using Box. And so as the years change, the policy doesn't have to change because you've already written in the policy, if you have an enterprise agreement and it's an enterprise application, you're allowed to use it. And so you just point to the policy and say, well, we don't use Dropbox, right, as uh, enterprise. So, A lot of times it's not written to say we block Slack or we block Discord or we block Signal, we block Tor. I mean, it's written very generally. So my question 
is really like, how do you decide to do this? And I think that's a question that a lot of people ask. And I'll tell you from my personal way of when I approach this is generally one, I point to the policy if it makes sense that it is written that way. Like it's clear that we don't use Dropbox as a corporate cloud sharing application. So this is our corporate solution. This is what you should be using. So that is usually a cut and dry way of doing it. Another way is if it's a clear security risk, right? Like Tor or BitTorrent or Ola VPN extension, right? Those are like clear things that users should not have on their machines. And so you block it. There are some gray areas that you can kind of say, I'm going to block this, but you know, this is the reason and it may not be a specific reason, but the director of security or people within the chain of command have dictated that this is a risk that we're going to mitigate. And so you can always use that as your excuse, essentially. I've used my old boss, Doug, as a crutch a lot of times. I'm like, yep, I've ran this by him. This is what he thinks, and this is the way we're going. And usually people accept that. For example, we've talked about in our device management episodes on different policies that we've used for that. And one of them is blocking third party keyboards on Android. And there was a lot of pushback from users who really enjoy using their third party keyboards. And it's great for usability because it predicts all of your words that are coming up because that it's seen and memorized all the things you've typed in there previously, including passwords, including PHI, including all the things that you do. And so great for usability, really, really bad for security. And so we ended up blocking it and users were unhappy with it, but we could point to the fact that this is a risk that the organization was not willing to take. So that's kind of the basis of it. And then really it comes down to kind of a gut, you know, as you're doing this enough and you see things come through you can kind of use your gut to decide like for example oauth for microsoft applications within azure or uh, uh, for your microsoft account your o365 account to oauth to it within azure we had changed that policy to verified apps only which is the recommended policy for oauth you can either allow users to OAuth all apps, you could deny them all, or you could say verified publishers and approved apps only. And that's the recommended setting. So once that happened, any apps that weren't published by Microsoft or approved previously would have to go through an approval. One of them came through and it was reads user profiles and able to create meetings within Teams and that's all they wanted to do. They wanted to be able to have this extension for Teams to create meetings within Teams. And then it had a couple extra read-only rights. And that seemed pretty benign to me. So I went ahead and approved it for the entire org. So no one else had to deal with it. I had another one come through that had a whole list of permissions, including read-write to all user mailboxes all shared mailboxes, all Teams channels, all Teams direct messages. I mean, the list went on. And this was not just read, but also read-write. And so that was more like a, hmm, I don't think this is something that we're going to approve. And I knew right away that there was going to be pushback, so I had to escalate it to you know, the chain and had them, you know, had Doug basically deliver the message saying, this is not a risk that we're willing to accept. So again, that wasn't any written policy to say this is the permissions we're going to allow and this is the permissions that we're not going to allow. It was more like a gut feeling. Like you look at it and the totality of the circumstance based on the list of permissions that it was requesting was that's too much, right? Like maybe a couple. We can maybe talk about it. So those are my methods of kind of deciphering what to allow and what not to allow for any type of policy or app in general. I always think of, and he had so many great quotes, but a, a great Steve Jobs quote where he said, we do not hire smart people to tell them what to do. We hire smart people so they can tell us what to do. And maybe I didn't get the quote exactly right, but close enough. Um, 
that you're you're describing an example of that where you bring on really smart people in your information security team and you allow them to use the totality of their experience, their background, their risk assessment, all of those capabilities they have and have honed over many years to make those decisions. And more often than not, they're going to be right. And they're going to err on the side of caution because that's what security professionals tend to do. And if there's massive pushback, then it can be evaluated more closely. Now, if you really wanted to put a bunch of process around this and dear God, I'm sure somebody somewhere already does this, but you could probably take a list of like all those OAuth settings, Andy, and you could assign like a risk score to every one of them, like a one, two, and a three, and you could go through and put them in your spreadsheet and it could kick out like, here's a score. And if it's above X score, we don't approve it. If it's below X score, we do approve it. And that sounds terrible, but there are ways to put, you know, more bureaucracy around this. If, if anybody's really dying for more spreadsheets and paperwork, sure you could, but this is an exactly an example of that jobs quote where hire great people and let them use their acumen to make those decisions. And they're going to be defensible almost all of the time. And if they're not, then hopefully if you err on the side of block at first, then there's that chance to reevaluate and maybe decide, okay, we'll accept this risk, but here's how we'll mitigate it in these key ways. So I'm not a fan of adding more rigor and process around everything. Sometimes I am. Sometimes I say like, you know, get really rigorous with this, really build process around this. And sometimes I say, look, hire human beings to be human and use their experience and don't try to reduce everything to an algorithm because some things are more subtle and more nuanced than an algorithm. And I believe this is one of them where you use that experience of how, how frequently have I run into this before? How often is this app being used? Is this app on a growth curve? Is it on a decline? Where is it in terms of the general consciousness of the population? Do a lot of people know about this? Is this going to be an ongoing concern or is this a one-off? Like those are all different nuanced parts of it that are really hard to represent in a spreadsheet, in an algorithm, in a formula, but humans are really, really good at doing. So that's where I err on the side of this, Andy, where I'm kind of agreeing with what you talked about, where you, you can write the policy generically enough that it gives you the backing that when you make that decision, you have that to justify your decision. Well, we block this app because it stores company data on a cloud environment that we don't have an agreement with. Boom. That's pretty much every SaaS app that you don't have an agreement with. So it's a really easy backing for it. And obviously you're not going to be able to do that a hundred percent of the time, but it's there when you need it to backstop your decision making. And you can point to it and say, you know, that's why we did this. Another gut check that I generally use as well is I don't put things in place that I don't want to use myself. Mm -hmm. So for example, when I deploy Intune or any type of MDM, I'm not going to lock it down to the point that if I had a phone that was enrolled in Intune, that it would be so locked down that it's unusable for me, right? Because I could do that. I could lock it down completely to the point where it's unusable. But I do it to the point where I think about, can I still use it? Is this something that I would want to use and how, how would that impact me? Now, sometimes, for example, in the case of applications like on machines, I use things that I would still block. I'll use Discord as an example. I communicate a lot with different Discords and I use it quite a bit in my personal life. And so having that on the computer makes life easier because I don't have to do it on my phone. However, most of the time, if I had to configure a policy, I would probably block communication to discord because it is completely unmanaged. You can literally drop in files into discord and exfiltrate them very, very easily. And so while it is a convenience for me, I also think about the general user. Like I'm not going to drop in files because I mean, that's my job is to protect the company and and the data. But what would a general user do? And like Adam said, kind of in the beginning, that casual exfiltration, like maybe they don't mean to do it, but it's certainly really easy to just drop a Word document into a DM or into a, a channel without thinking twice about it and hitting send. And then all of a sudden it's in Discord. So 
to me, from a security aspect, if I'm thinking about the 99% of the users that are out there and I had to configure it, I would configure it in a way that is going to protect the majority. So I would block it, even though it's going to be a detriment to me. So again, there's a, there's a balance there. Sometimes I, I do think about it, how it would impact me, but also what's the best for the company. You know, to use kind of a, an example or an analogy, if you think of medicine, there are only certain people in medicine who are allowed to use certain tools. The receptionist at the front desk isn't allowed to use a scalpel, but a doctor is because the doctor knows how to use that tool properly and correctly. And I think it's something like that where, again, and, and I am not a fan, and I agree with you, Andy, of security people need to eat their own dog food. You should not create exemptions for yourself um, frequently. But there are certain cases where you are a professional. You understand what is sensitive, what is important, what is company data, what exfiltration is, like, <laughs> and, and you know how to avoid that. And so there's, there needs to be a certain level of trust where you can use these tools because you've proven an aptitude in how they can be used safely and correctly um, compared to somebody who might just not have trained with it. And it's better to just not allow them to use that tool. And again, security people, eat your own dog food. If you apply a device management policy, then you run it too. Your device is managed with that same policy. Don't lock down things in a way that you wouldn't want to use them. I loathe that behavior more than anything when security people lock a bunch of stuff down and then don't, you know, follow their own actions. Um, that is not good behavior and it's not a good way to get buy-in from anyone. It, it, but there's, at the same time, I understand the point of um, allowing somebody who is trained in, in a tool to use a tool that not everybody is trained in as well. And, you know, I, I respected my previous boss, Doug, who we had on the show a few weeks ago in many, many ways. And one of the things that he always told me was that he wanted to experience whatever we were doing the same way as another user was experiencing it. So if he had a machine, it would be configured the same way, loaded the same, with the same policies. If he had a phone, it'd be loaded the same way with the same policies. And so I treated him like a normal user and deployed the same things to him. Sometimes they would be in advance, you know, just to test, but most of the time he'd want to have the same experience so that number one, he could say like, I'm using it in the same way you are. And so there's no difference. And two, you know, if, if there were any issues, he would know how to troubleshoot them if needed. Right. So um, that's a, I think that's a good method of, of following your own rules. So like Adam said, eat your own dog food. And so that's kind of leads into the whole exemption or exception policy, because in general, nothing is 100%, almost always to a security policy or some sort of rule that you have in place. There's always going to be some sort of exception. Some things you don't, like if it's a strict security policy, like Tor, like BitTorrent, right? Like VPN, external VPNs. Okay, those are not allowed and straight up no exceptions allowed, right? But for example, in cloud storages, sometimes in organizations you get an external partner or an external customer that sends you a link, like at Microsoft, we obviously use OneDrive as our main cloud storage um, solution. But maybe I have a customer who needs to share something with me and they send me a Dropbox because they're an enterprise Dropbox customer. So they send that to me. And if Microsoft blocked that because they're like, well, we don't want you exfiltrating data, then I wouldn't be able to access something that a customer sent me. And so when those exceptions come come up it's important to really think about it in a holistic aspect again with the company in mind and say well we're not going to just allow dropbox completely maybe that is the the answer if it's like 95 percent of your users need to use dropbox okay well if 95 percent of users are interacting with external people who are sending them dropbox maybe the customer needs to switch Sometimes, you know, you say, we are the larger organization, you're our customer, and so you're going to have to use the solution that we dictated. This is our security solution. Sometimes that's what you have to do. Other times, 
you put in an exception for a very, very small group. I've done that quite a bit where, you know, only certain people are in this particular exception policy for this particular application. So think about it that way. You know, obviously, if it makes sense to include the entire org because they're a large partner, it's a big business, and the business is willing to accept that risk, then go for it. But oftentimes, just like any type of role-based access, you want to scope the limited access to the smallest number of people who need that application as much as possible. I think you touched on everything there as far as when you should carve out exceptions, when maybe you shouldn't put the block in place entirely, when you should potentially use your size to articulate to your customers, your downstream customers, um, how they will interact with your organization. Those are all things org should and can and often do. So I I think you hit everything there. Um, The only thing I would reiterate again is look through what that exception process looks like. Make sure there's revalidation. It's not a lifetime exception. It's a, you know, annual exception and we'll revalidate it in a year that you still need it. Um, And look at how long that exception process takes. If it's a really long, terrible, awful process, maybe just don't block it because you're, you're really causing impact to the business. And maybe the win is not worth the cost. Uh, Those are all things you need to evaluate as you do this. Now, hopefully you can get that really tight and really fast and deliver those exceptions quickly, build some sort of workflow and say like a service now, that'd be awesome. Um, But if it's really manual, really human, the ball gets dropped all the time and the business is sitting there unable to do their work, that's not okay. Um, And so make sure your exception process is really tight and really streamlined as much as possible because again, we're here to enable the business. And that is something we need to keep top of mind. We're trying to mitigate their risk. We're trying to help them secure their business, but ultimately they need to get their work done. So that's something to keep top of mind too. Super good call out on the revalidation. That's something that I've dropped the ball on before because it's just not something you think about. You, you put in the exemption policy. These people have exemptions, but what if they move to a different team Mm -hmm. and they don't need that anymore? So yeah, that's a great call out. Maybe you have a, a process to document the exception policies and when you're going to cycle back and review those for revalidation. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the things that Adam alluded to towards the beginning of the show that we're going to end with is kind of a different way of thinking about how to protect your data because a lot of this just comes down to protecting the users and ultimately protecting the data in your organization. So when you're thinking about it, can you block everything or is there a different way? Now, yes, you can go through and block the things that you're able to block if you should block them. So for example, if you don't use Dropbox, go ahead and block it, right? Like if that's not an enterprise org- organization application, then block it because that's a quick win. If they can't exfiltrate data to Dropbox, great. Block Discord, block Signal, if that makes sense, right? Because if there's no specific business use for signal it's probably personal and they probably have their personal phone that has signal on it so you know go ahead and block it on desktops so there's no reason why you shouldn't avoid blocking something if you can block it and it makes sense to do it now like adam said you can't just block everything there's always going to be something unless you have a implicit block explicit allow some sort of policy right like we're blocking everything you can't install anything and we are going to install the things for you now sometimes for kiosks or users who are in a specific mode you know they only use one app like a call center or something like that where they're just constantly you know either on the browser or using the app to call or whatever and they don't need anything else then you probably can use an implicit block, uh, explicit allow mode of operation. But for most users, most organizations, we have other methods, right? So, for example, last week we had a security discussion about Windows Defender Credential Guard. Well, one of the other things that we're going to touch on later on and kind of dive deep into is another feature called Windows Defender Application Control which is a way of controlling what type of apps are installed 
based on either reputation or some sort of code integrity. So there's a lot of different ways of having an allow list to say only these type of apps are installed. Another really interesting method is, you know, what if instead of blocking Dropbox or blocking Box or blocking WeTransfer, whatever cloud storage application you're trying to block, the idea is to protect the data. What if I encrypt the data using some sort of key that is escrowed with my organization, maybe with Azure or Microsoft, and you have to be an enterprise user with Microsoft in order to decrypt that information. So wherever that file goes, it's encrypted using the organization key. Well, there's something called Microsoft Information Protection, which you can apply different labels, different policies, who can access this information. They have to be on the specific security group or have a domain and email address, a Microsoft Office sign-in using a specific domain in order to access that information. So that's another way of thinking about it. Instead of blocking the app outright, well, we'll just protect the information. You put it on USB, it's protected. You upload it to Discord, it's protected. So we'll dive into that quite a bit more in another show, but we kind of just want to drop a little bit of the solutions that are out there. Instead of thinking about blocking the apps outright, you could protect the information that no matter where it gets exfiltrated to, then it won't be able to be accessed. So one, I'll give one example before I let you jump in, Adam. When I worked for Microsoft previously, and then I went to Exact Sciences, there was a period where I had some PowerPoints or decks that were saved to my desktop on an Intune joined machine that I had that were internal only. And they were protected so that even when I accessed them, they were there, the files were there, but because they were protected using my at Microsoft.com account, as soon as I tried to open them, they asked me to sign in. And of course, once I wasn't an employee, I didn't have credentials. And so I couldn't access the information. So it doesn't matter where those files were. They could have been in my, my Google Drive, if I used Google Drive, um, and they wouldn't have been able to be accessed. So that's one way to think about it, a, a better way, I think, personally. Yeah, it, so information protection, let's let's just make a note, Andy, let's do a show on it because there's a ton there and I think our listeners would love it. But the key concept there to understand, and we're doing this in a lot of other areas of security, is as opposed to treating everything the same, we're getting more granular. So think of the movement from I open a single VPN connection and I perform authentication, hopefully some for second factor. But at that point, I am now a node on the internal corporate network, and I can go wherever I want to go and see whatever I want to see. I have passed a single gate, and now I have access to all the things. As opposed to more of a zero trust model, where I might have to authenticate individually to each application. They're all proxied separately, and I have to gate through like a conditional access policy for every single app. And so just because I've signed into one app doesn't mean I have access to another one unless I am still compliant to meet all the requirements. This is kind of like that in the sense of everything we've talked about to this point is more like any data is sensitive data from the org. And maybe that's true, but in most cases, it's not. Like if Sherry is having her retirement party in the cafeteria next Tuesday, we probably don't care if that gets exfiltrated. But on the other hand, if it is the secret blend of herbs and spices for KFC, we probably care if that gets exfiltrated. And so if we apply protection at the file level and we can differentiate between the sensitivity of that information with those labels and apply different levels of protection and visual marking and everything else. Now we're being more granular and protecting what we need to protect while not spinning our wheels, worrying about things that maybe aren't really that scary in the first place. And so that's a whole other conversation, but I love planting the seed here to think about it in terms of ultimately our goal is to protect company data. And that's a way to do that in a more granular basis. And we talk about defense in depth all the time. That doesn't mean you don't want to 
do some of the other things we've talked about because ultimately, you know, the encryption algorithms are really strong. We can put them out there on these other platforms. Probably people aren't going to be able to get into them because they don't have valid creds or whatever, but you still have put something out there that somebody could potentially bang on with a supercomputer or something and try to crack. I don't know. There's, it's better if it's just not there at all, but it's defense in depth and that's a good thing. So one final note to think about too, with all of this is DLP solutions. And there's a number of different ones of them out there. Symantec, um, force point on and on and on. Microsoft recently got in the scheme too. They have an endpoint DLP solution as well, and they can range from really not sophisticated to pretty sophisticated where they might treat every file the same. This is a work file. You can't do that to, well, let me look at the content of the file before I make a decision on what you can do with it. And, oh, I see something sensitive in this file. So no, it cannot go on your flash drive. No, it cannot go to a third-party cloud, et cetera, et cetera. So DLP solution can kind of help where it makes that decision on where you can exfiltrate data based on different signals and attributes of files and everything else and can, again defense in depth. If you just do an outright block on certain sites, then you're not relying on the DLP to accurately make a decision. But then for things you haven't gotten to or haven't looked at yet, it can be another layer of protection where hopefully with a good DLP solution, it's going to make the right call and prevent that data from leaving when it should. And so all of this comes back to you need a defense in depth strategy There's no single magic bullet that fixes all of this, but this is a good conversation to think about as another tool in your toolbox to help protect your organization's information. So hopefully we had a good conversation here on basically how to decipher that question of should I be blocking this or should I not? And that's ultimately what I wanted to kind of walk our listeners through, especially if this is your job. Maybe you're the only security person at a company or you're one of two and you're trying to stand up a security program, which I think is a lot of folks out there. How do you really build that program? How do you decide that? And it's through experience. You kind of have to use what knowledge you have based around the risk that the company is willing to accept and go from there. So great conversation tonight, Adam. Thanks for listening to all of our listeners out there. Our contact information will be in the show notes. If you have any questions or follow-up topics that you want us to talk about, definitely reach out to us. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.